Back up, pessoal, bem-vindos novamente ao Underground Voice ao vivo. Hoje tenho uh, a enorme honra de, de conhecer o Trey, uh, guitarrista do Mr. Bungle. Uh, man, thank you so much for being here. Such an honor to meet you and to, to have you there at Underground's Voice. Um, I'm a huge fan of the band and of your work. Um, so, uh, Mr. Bungle, come back would we'll always be uh, an often thing, uh, not only for metalheads, but all for all the music lovers. Uh, and this comeback after 20 years of something uh, was kind of unexpected. So when and why did you guys think about this return? Um, it was mainly a, a spontaneous uh, decision. I think um, Trevor was a, the, had the idea to do it um, as a death metal band to return to our, our roots. And like most bands that maybe unlike most bands that return to their roots for us, that meant, you know, playing thrash metal and, uh, or like kind of death metal thrash metal. So that, that appealed to all of us. Every other idea of doing a reunion was something that we would all be like, yeah, we could, yeah, that would be cool, but uh, just never inspired any of us. But this idea just took root, maybe partially because Dave Lombardo was standing there when the idea came up. And then it's like, okay, well, yeah, we could, we could definitely do this. Yeah. Um, the original, the Raging Rad of the Easter Bunny was released in, in 86 as a demo. Uh, and it's highly influenced by some of the most extreme bands of the 80s, um, in particular uh, Slayer and Anthrax. Um, and now, uh, as you said, you have the ex-Slayer drummer, Dave Lombardo, and the Anthrax guitar player, Scott, uh, on the band. Uh, it's awesome. So how was this possible? Well, I mean, I guess in some ways it's really, uh, it's the most obvious thing to do and also the most impossible dream. It, you know, it, most of that music was, I think we wrote and recorded most of it in towards the end of 1985. And um, that's like, I think that the SOD record had just come out, um, which definitely, had, played a huge role in the in that era of Mr. Bungle also. So probably more than Anthrax was SOD, the guitar tone, you know. Uh, so if you were to ask yourself when you're 15 years old, you know, who would you love to have in your band? Probably at that time, I would have said Dave Lombardo and Scott Ian, you know. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's, it's as good as it fucking gets. So, it, you know, for doing that music, it, that's stuck in that era and that consciousness for us, like our music from that moment. Oh my God. You know, even just asking them and saying them saying yes was incredible. I, I think we, we knew Lombardo was into it, but nobody really knew how Scott Ian would react. And his reaction was so great. Like he was already familiar with the music. He had been listening to it since the eighties. Like I'm fucking believable. It's awesome. Um, you guys re-recorded the demo and it was released uh, as an album in October. Uh, man, it's a huge masterpiece. I really love that. Uh, I'll not say that's one of the best albums of the year. I'll really say that's one of the best albums I heard in the last decade, for sure. Um, so wow. I was being all the feedback of, from everyone. It's nothing but positive. Like, you know, all of our... I think, you know what... I think we did it right in this in one really important way, which was to learn the music, you know, about, I don't know, eight months ahead of time, everybody started rehearsing on their own. And then to play some live shows, you know, to get the chemistry of the band going, which really was snowballing by the time we started playing shows and then going into the studio right after that. And the other thing is that, you know, it's not just, going into the studio, like we recorded this the way a real band records, which is to go in, have everybody play in the same room, you know, capture what you're doing and overdub just little fixes. You can just try to catch, catch the energy. And as it turns out, the studio that we recorded that record at, um, which is Dave Grohl's 606 studio, even the like, you know, the legendary mixing board at this place, the, the history, all the incredible records that have been made on that board, 
I, I didn't really realize it at the time, but now I feel like, you know, we're kind of part of that history because we approached the studio the same way, you know, fucking Fleetwood Mac did in the mid seventies, you know, using the same board. So the, the, whole, the whole project ended up being infused with all of the, the right ingredients. And that's one of them. That's another one of them is that the studio was the right place for it. And the whole approach and attitude towards recording the record was very old school. And I think that's why it worked so well. Yeah. yeah. And these songs were composed when you were on night school, right? Yeah, I was 15. I think Grizzly Adams, I think I wrote that first intro bit when I was 14, actually. Yeah, and um, it's been a long time since that. So you grew up as a person, as artist. Um, Mike became a, a legend and everyone uh, loves him and knows him. Uh, you did a lot of different things and uh, experimental stuff too. Um, the metal scene is also um, really different back, back in that day. Um, all the world is different. So was was easy to, to reconnect with all these songs. Uh, did you... I don't know, did you thought in any moment if these songs would still make sense in 2020? My personal feeling on that was that as long as we stuck exclusively to doing, you know, like mid 80s thrash approach in our, in our whole approach, then yeah, it would be super strong, It'd be really good. If we tried to do it where we, you know, tried to make it perfect and cut all the little pieces together and make it sound like technical metal from now, it would have been a fucking disaster. It would have sounded like shit. So, yeah, I mean, um, also like, I, you know, I do fucking a lot of metal anyway. Like metal is current for me uh, in the sense that I've played lots of um, more extreme kind of metal in, the, in my band, the Secret Chiefs 3. Um, I produced the Imperial Triumphant record like right after recording the Bungle record. So like, but that's totally different world that, like, you know, as, as far as like avant-garde, uh, authentically avant-garde metal music from 2020, I mean, you couldn't be more opposite in some ways. Um, but at the same time, this, you know, there's still a real band. They go in and actually fucking record. Unlike a lot of the bands, like, you know, I, I really love that kind of, you know, metal to me has to be human. I really fucking hate this thing of like, oh, that dude, man, that drummer, he's like a machine. Like, well, if he's like a fucking machine, then he doesn't have any anger. And if he doesn't have any anger, he shouldn't be playing fucking metal. Like, fuck off, you know? I don't know, I, I have a very strong feeling about that. So to me, if I'm gonna step, put even a foot into the metal world, it's gonna be for the sake of aggression and, you know, kind of, you know, negative feelings that, that metal brings out. Yeah. And this new version have some differences comparing to, to the original demo. Um, so two questions about that. Uh, why Evil Satan is not on the album? And uh, what can you tell us about why you did this, uh, why you included these covers of Sod and Corrosion of Conformity too? Well, e Evil Satan, we, I did, we were thinking about doing a version of it, like um, maybe turning it into sort of a, like a saltarello or, you know, some like a, a piece of music from the middle ages, you know, and doing it all on acoustic instruments. That would have been pretty funny, but frankly, we just kind of ran out of time. Um, wasn't really worth salvaging anyway. It's a pretty stupid song. <laughs> it better to use the time on, uh, yeah, like the, the COC song that we did is something we played like a lot in the 90s. Um, and it's just a fucking killer, like crossover metal punk song um, and Reed had just died. You know, it's just, there, there were a lot of good reasons to do it. And um, the speak Spanish or die thing, I mean, that just snowballed. As soon as that was even mentioned as an idea, I was like, oh my God, in this political climate, this is the perfect thing to do. We gotta do, we gotta do speak Spanish or die. And Mr. Bungalow is a huge band. Uh, but we know that some people only know the band because of Disco Volante or California, um, or even because it's the other band of Mike Patton. Um, so this come back with this album, with like this really extreme album, uh, might be, and this, what we do is with this lineup too. Um, maybe it's a shock for, for those people, right? 
But I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. And shock, shocking the audience is nothing new for Mr. Bungle. So, you know, uh, and also the other thing that's nothing new for Mr. Bungle is doing whatever the hell we want to do. So, you know, that was kind of the idea too, is this, this is the right thing for us to do. We, we all believe in it. Our hearts are in it. All the pieces are aligned. If there's people who are like, it doesn't sound like the clown album. I mean, we, we knew that. They were saying that when we did Disco of a Latte. They were saying, you know, people complaining, they're not avant-garde anymore when we did California. Uh, you know, it's always, it's always going to be that shit. And I respect that too, because it might not be your cup of tea. And also the cool thing about the little trail of crumbs that we've dropped is that people who hate a record right away, a lot of them return to it a couple years later and it becomes like their favorite record. Like, just all of that is positive. Like, there's nothing bad about any of that. So I, I think it's great when people are like, I don't know if I like this metal shit. What the hell are they doing? Or even when metal people come in and are like, who are these old fucks trying to sound like Slayer? You know, I, I, it's fun watching the, the fans be like, yeah, that's right. But they wrote this shit at the same time as Slayer. And that's Dave Lombardo. So fuck you. Like, th these debates are, are awesome. Anyway, you're Mr. Bungle. So it, it always will be unexpected, right? I, we, I swear we don't design it that way. It's just, you know, that's just kind of, we, we follow our natural muse and it tends to be, yeah, not what people are expecting. I don't know why that's the case, but yeah. we're sort of used to that. Yeah. Well, I was born in 1990. So many of the classics such Raining Blood of Master of Puppets or Rust in Peace or all these albums uh, were released even before I was born. So I listened to them uh, about 20 years later, probably for the first time. Um, even though they're considered the best album from, from the history of metal, um, I've, I've always wondered how people reacted back then to, to this album because it was something new, never, never done before by anyone. Um, so listening this album for, for the first time, um, made me kind of feel uh, that because it's literally um, an 86 album recording in 2019. Uh, so do you think that um, this album uh, would be recorded as an album back in that day would be um, would be such a, a great album as the, uh, the, the ones I said? Partially, yeah. I, I think that if it had a proper recording back in the moment of it, it, um, I mean, depending, we, we weren't really in the scene or anything. So, you know, the, all, the scene sort of determined everything in the thrash metal moment, you know. So we never played at Ruthie's Inn. Like we didn't, you know, we weren't, we were reading about that shit and we were imagining what it would be like to play with, you know, Possessed and Merciful Fate and, Metallica or whatever and uh you know at a fucking crazy place like Ruthie's but uh we weren't doing it and we couldn't so we imagined it when we made it up and I have a feeling that yeah if we had gone into the studio at that time it would have it would have worked out pretty good you know <laughs> it wouldn't have been the same without Lombardo and fucking Scott Ian obviously you know that's a difference but I, I think we would have made our mark as a metal band yeah definitely the the material's I hear it now, like my favorite record from that time besides Rain and Blood is uh, Possessed Seven Churches, which to me still holds up like in every way. It's convincingly frightening and the riffs are just so powerful and evil and just it's just so wrong. That was another huge influence on us, by the way, was Possessed, like probably the biggest one uh, in a way. Um, and I feel like in that world, in the possessed world, I think we would have been, we would have been all right. I don't know about keeping up a Slayer and, you know, that as people, there's no way we were, we were going to stay just doing metal. That was not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the 90s on this new metal, big explosion, which, which is, was also a completely new thing when it appeared. So I'm not comparing uh, quality or genres, but it exploded just like the trash exploded on the 80s. So can we say yeah. that in a certain way, a, a new Slayer album or a Possessed album uh, back in that day 
uh, was the same thing that uh, released for a Korn album uh, in the 90s? I don't know. I actually, I don't know. I don't really know how, like the, in the millennial generation, I don't know how they receive important records like that. Because I know that us, man, when, a, when, the, like when Ride the Lightning came out, when Hell Awaits came out, and then Rain and Blood came out, this is like you're sitting and listening to it over and over and over again, learning every part, like, you know, memorizing the drum fills, competing with each other to, to know all of the lyrics on the record, uh, just studying it backwards, forwards and up and down and trying to understand the, the, the logic of why, why does this part sound so evil and sick, you know? I think every metalhead was doing that. Like it, even people who are non-musicians, they're, they're just, completely obsessed because there weren't a lot of records being made. So I don't know, like maybe in the nineties, there was tons of different, by the, by the nineties, like you have all the different labels for all the different kinds of metal, right? And people have made their decision like, well, I'm into to technical death metal or, or, you know, I'm into fucking whatever, porn core. <laughs> it just got so overwhelmingly uh, detailed in definitions that I feel, I feel like Maybe in the 80s, since there weren't so many definitions, you would hear something and give it more of a chance and kind of dive really deeply into it, perhaps. But I don't know. There's probably people who got super fucking obsessed with Pantera the same way, you know, probably so. And by the way, I, I listened to, to Pantera's first three glam metal records. I have, I have them all on vinyl, the glam, glam metal period. Glam metal. Um, so you guys had some uh, a few U U.S. Uh, shows last year. So how was the feeling to be on stage again with Mr. Bunga? It was awesome. Totally different than you know any other time we we'd played before. It was different for me because I've never actually played. I've played fucking like speed death metal in smaller situation. I've never played that kind of stuff in front of three thousand people before. So just the physics of being far from the drummer, relying on the monitors for everything. That was all pretty new to me actually. And um, luckily we all rehearsed our fucking asses off. So otherwise, I, I mean, if it was like, yeah, I'll just show up and play my parts and everything will be fine. It would have been a disaster. But I kind of, I saw how seriously Scott Ian was taking it. And it was like, okay, good. I, I need to stress about this and be worried about every detail. Because when it, when it comes to like standing there and playing the shit, yeah, it, nothing's going to be perfect. You're not going to be able to hear the, the, the snare drum perfectly or the kick drum perfectly. So you got to really be on top of what you're doing. And Mr. Bungo was inactive for so many years. And now that you came back, we've been eaten by a terrible pandemic. So how was that affected your plans for the past years and the near future? Yeah, kind of, it's interfered. We definitely were making plans to do some touring, you know, not big long tours, but, you know, visiting different countries and stuff. And unfortunately, all of that had to be postponed indefinitely. Um, yeah, that sucks. That's the worst part about the, the pandemic. Otherwise, like for me, like I'm, I'm a naturally, it's too good. Like for me, the pandemic is, is awesome because I'm a naturally antisocial person. So I have an excuse to be completely antisocial and it's kind of nice. I'm sort of dreading when it all opens up again, but sucks that the music industry died. But you know what? It was doing a pretty good job of fucking killing itself before the pandemic. Something that people forget how fucking bad things were getting. So, you know, yeah, okay, let's blame it all on the pandemic. I don't know. We'll see what happens as we come out of it. But me personally, I've been... I've been okay during the, the pandemic, other than it interrupting the, our touring schedule. Yeah. And beside these uh, possible shows on, and tours in the future, do you actually have plans to compose new songs and release new albums in the future? As Mr. Bungle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we haven't made any formal plans like that. Um, there's been a couple of little ideas thrown around, but we, we did record a little bit more music than came out on the on that record. So yeah, I mean, there's little, there's little things that we can do. Um, but I think we probably wait for the next big lightning strike before we start writing or anything like that. We hope so. We, we would love a new, a new album. 
Um, and about the Portuguese metal, do, do you know something about, about us? Portuguese metal. I only know, God damn it, and I don't know the name, but you know there was a, you know the, the Legions Noir, the, the French, the black metal underground yeah. sick thing that was going on? There was a Portuguese one of, uh, of those that I discovered like two years ago and it was the sickest one I ever heard. It was so great. And then I lost the, I didn't save the, the link to it. So maybe you can help me find it. What, what, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, we probably Gary or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it was no drums or anything. It's just, you know, kind of, I don't think it was since it might've been pump organ just really gloomy and a voice going, <laughs> fucking really good. Yeah, we have, we have a lat of great bands there. Yeah, I know. I, I'm sadly, I'm not up on Portuguese metal at all. Like I, I'm up on Brazilian metal, but I've missed the, the, the wagon. I would love to be educated on it because I'm sure there's great shit there. And so many great musicians in Portugal. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we have. And finally, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a huge honor to, to meet you once again and to talk to you and to have you there at Telegram's Voice. Really an honor. Uh, so thank you once again. And last words for the Portuguese fans and Underground's Voice viewers. Yeah, well, uh, definitely hoping to get back to Portugal. Uh, I usually show up there with my other band, Secret Chiefs 3, and uh, we've had good times there for sure. So it uh, won't be long before, before something happens there. And it's going to be metal, by the way. <laughs> Secret Juice is turning, you know, it's been on the, it's been planning for a decade now to finally, you know, to take on its metal persona. So we will be coming with metal sometime in the next few years. Hope so. Uh, thank you so much and, and stay safe too. Thanks. You too, man. Great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you.